Welcome to the online module of ventilation workshop as part of Kerala Nilcon 2023. In this session, after dealing with the physiology of ventilation, now we will be moving on to the monitoring of a ventilated baby using chest x-rays and EPG. So this session would focus on the chest x-ray part of the monitoring of a ventilated baby. As all of us know, chest x-rays are the most commonly performed investigation in NICUs, primarily to diagnose underlying pathology to formulate a treatment plan. In case the baby is already ventilated and in case of worsening respiratory distress, and after we have ruled out the dope situation, predominantly the mechanical problems like tube obstruction, tube lock, and we need to find out the cause for this respiratory distress worsening. And third, but one of the very important indications would be to confirm the position of tubes and lines in the baby. We are all used to the routine x-ray taking with respect to after each intubation, maybe after each, each uh, de change, for every desaturation in otherwise stable baby, or sometimes to document radiological clearance before we plan extubation. So these so-called routine investigations. Uh, routine indication for x-rays have to be discouraged in use. Moving on to the basics of x-ray in ICU. So as everything in neonatology starts with hand hygiene, infection control is very important, especially of the caregiver and the technician who is going to take the x-ray. And the role of the staff nurse would be to ensure that the baby remains euthermic, doesn't go into hypothermia, and takes care of the comfort of the baby, quietens the baby if the baby is fussy so that we get a good picture. And from the technician's point of view, the most important of first responsibility would be to properly position the baby. So how do you position the baby in NICU for taking x-rays? Most commonly done projection is AP view. So for taking AP view x-rays in NICU, the baby has to be supine with the upper limbs or the hands on the line on the sides of the chest or the trunk and not as shown in this picture you can see the hands are lifted up above the head which should be discouraged and this is one thing which we often encounter in NICU because this lifting up of the hands above the head will lead on to lifting up of the thorax as well and this can distort the image taken and as you can see in the second picture the baby is directly on the, placed on the cassette, which is strongly discouraged because this, is, this can lead on to hypothermia. So you should have a warm cloth, warm clean cloth over the cassette and the baby should be never placed directly on the cassette. So these are three common mistakes which we do while positioning the baby for x-rays. The second point to take care of in positioning the baby is the head should be in the neutral position, neither too flexed, not too extended, because that can again cause changes in the ED tube position. So it is the head should be in the neutral position, should be in the midline. The upper limb should be on the side of the trunk as far as possible and should never lift it up above the head. Now what projection do you actually require? So as we already discussed in uh, NICU and non-ambulant patients, it is the antro-posterior view which we take meaning the x-rays travel from the anterior to the posterior part aspect of the patient. This right hand side picture shows the PA view, meaning the x-rays travel from the posterior aspect of the patient to the anterior aspect. So we basically take AP view. Now given an x-ray, how do you differentiate between AP versus PA view? This is an AP view picture. As you can see in AP view, the spine, the body, vertebral body, are more prominent when compared to the PA view and the second point of difference is that the, there is a parent cardiomegaly which is seen in AP, AP view versus the PA view. Another point uh, I would like to emphasize which we usually uh, don't uh, stress upon in NICs while taking X-ray is that the X-ray beams should never be allowed to fall perpendicular, directly perpendicular to the baby. There should be a little angulation of at least 10 degree. So for this, either you play either one of them, the X-ray beam, the X-ray machine or the baby should be at an angle so that the X-rays do not 
for problem with her on the baby. So sometimes we keep the baby um, baby's head at elevated to 10 degree or you can either tilt the x-ray beam or the head of the x-ray to 10 degree cordially so that the x-rays do not land directly perpendicular to the baby. Having uh, talked about the APB, we do do infrequently perform lateral x-rays as well. The indication for lateral x-rays would be if you have a uh, little air collection, if you want to find out uh, small remote facts or you have free fluid in the uh, in the uh, if you have fluid, uh, pure free fluid and uh, little amount of free fluid, uh, we use the sort of lateral x-rays and uh, rarely for the assessment of the mediastinal mass as well. So that was the technical aspect of taking x-ray, the positioning of the baby for taking x-ray. Now, beginning with the proper interpretation of the x-ray. So be before you begin with the interpretation, it is important that you ensure that the, the x-rays are properly labeled with the date as well as the time of shooting the x-ray and the laterality is also marked. So, uh, for in interpretation of any lab result or any radiological investigation, you should be sure of the quality of the uh, investigations you are dealing with. So, in our case, it is X-ray. So, you should be sure of the quality of X-ray. Now, how do you assess the quality of X-ray? <coughs> the quality of X-ray is basically assessed with respect to these three important parameters. First is see for the rotation of the film. Second is look whether the film is taken during the inspiratory or the expiratory phase of breathing and third would be the penetration of the x-rays. So with respect to the rotation, how do you know this if this x-ray is a rotated film or not? So for that you need to look into the clavicle. So both ends of the both middle ends of the clavicle should be equidistant from the spine, from the center of the spine in case of the well-centered x-ray. And if you can draw a line meeting both the ends of the clavicle and draw perpendicular down the down from that line to the uh, into the spine that that should form a T. So this is a line which meets uh, both ends of the clavicle and if we can drop a perpendicular down from this line to the middle of the uh, spine this forms a T. And the other point uh, in case of a well-centered x-ray would be that both the hemithoraces would appear symmetrical. The ribs are almost parallel to each other. So in this case, it is a well-centered x-ray, it is not rotated. Whereas if you look into these x-rays, you see that if you look at the x-ray over the left, you see that the clavicles are not equidistant from the midline. And you see the ribs are also one side the rib, the, there is asymmetry in the hemithorax and on one side the ribs are longer than the other side. So this is an x-ray which is rotated to the left. How do you know it is rotated to the left? One point of importance is that to whichever side, in whichever side the rib is longer, the x-ray would be rotated to that side. So when you look at this x-ray, uh, this again is a rotated x-ray but it is rotated to the right because it is a right hemithorax. The right ribs are longer than the left one, and it is the clavicle, right clavicle is at a higher position than the left clavicle. So, this is a grossly rotated film, and the rotation is towards the right. So, the second point in the quality of the x ray is to look at the uh, phase of breathing. In which phase of breathing this x ray was shot, whether it was in the inspiratory phase or the expiratory phase. It is very difficult to interpret the x-ray in the expiratory phase and never attempt to uh, interpret an x-ray in the expiratory phase. So in case of it, in case the uh, x-ray was shot in the inspiratory phase, we should be able to see at least 8 ribs posteriorly and 6 ribs anteriorly. So in a well shot inspiratory film, we will be able to count at least 8 ribs posteriorly and 6 ribs anteriorly. Now, how will you differentiate between posterior ribs and anterior ribs? So, I, as you can see in this x-ray, these are the posterior ribs. The posterior ribs are straight, they are close to the spine, whereas the anterior ribs are angulated and they are away from the spinous process of the vertebral body. So, either you count the posterior ribs or you can count the anterior ribs and 6 to 8 ribs, 8 ribs posteriorly and 6 ribs anteriorly if you are able to count 
that means this is an inspiratory film. So this is the same baby whose x-rays were taken in different uh, phases of uh, breathing. One was during expiration, so you, there is an apparent cardiomegaly and this was a normal film which was taken during inspiration. So there is a lot of differences depending upon the phase of breathing and never try to interpret an x-ray in the expiratory film. The penetration as you can see, this is an underexposed film where the lungs are uh, quite white out, the bottom body is it's not standing out, it's not very clear. Whereas on the other hand, this is an hyperexposed film or overexposed film where you can see the lungs are too much black in color, the vertebral bodies stand out and you are not able to distinguish the skin and the subcutaneous tissue here. So both of these pictures you don't want in your baby's x-ray. So that is uh, regarding the quality of the x-ray. So interpretation starts with assessing the quality of the x-ray. You assess the quality of the x-ray with respect to rotation with respect to what phase of breathing the x-ray was taken, it is a good idea to get it in the inspiratory phase and third would be assess the penetration of the x-ray. Now after you have assessed the quality of the film, now let us move on to the structured stepwise approach of uh, interpreting the x-rays. So they have put the synonym of A, B, C, D, E and F. So if you move about in this step, uh, you are not, you will not miss many things in the x-ray interpretation. So starting with the A part, A stands for airway, hilum, mediastinum and lungs. So airway, as you can see, the trachea and the tracheal bifurcation, depending upon the position of the airway, in the pathology can vary. For example, if there is a pathology, if there is a collapse on one side, the airway will be pulled to the same side and if there is a uh, new pneumothorax or a pleural effusion on one side, the airway as well as the mediastinal structures can be pushed to the opposite side. This we will be discussing more in detail in the uh, coming uh, slides. So um, not to forget uh, to have a look at the airway in the to begin with and interpreting the chest x-ray. And next moving down to the hilum part, the hilum basically houses the pulmonary vasculature, the pulmonary lymphatics and uh, in newborns it is a pulmonary a vasculature which becomes the hyla prominence as well as the pulmonary vasculature which are more important in interpretation. So in this x-ray which is seen on the left side you can see that there is increased pulmonary vascular markings which is almost reaching the periphery and this is suggestive of increased pulmonary blood flow or pulmonary plethora. Whereas on the other hand if you take this x-ray the pulmonary vascular markings are not seen beyond the initial one per or the middle one per of the lung. So there is pulmonary oligemia. One important thing is normally in an X-ray lung, you would be able to appreciate lung markings till the middle one third of the lung. That is, you if you supposing that you divide the lung into median one third, middle one third, and lateral one third, normal vascular markings would reach up to the middle one third. In case of pulmonary oligemia, it would be limited to the middle one third. In case of pulmonary plethora, it would be extending beyond the middle one third, reaching the lateral one third or the periphery of the lung. So this is a pulmonary plethora, and this is this indicates pulmonary oligemic lung fields. So now moving down to the mediastinum after hilum, there is an important structure uh, housed in the mediastinum, especially in newborns, and that is the thymus. So it is important that you know the normal thymic shadows which you get to see in the x-rays otherwise it might be misunderstood for some consolidation or other lung pathologies. So there are named signs uh, for the thymic shadows. This represents a sail and hence this is called the uh, sail sign and here sometimes you get the thymic wave sign which is as you can see in this picture it is because of the uh, undulations which is formed by the inferior part of the thymus on the ribs. So these the both, uh, these signs are quite commonly seen in newborn x-rays. Uh, along with the presence of thymus and other thymic uh, radiological shadows, it is important that you look for the actual presence of thymus, whether there is hypoplasia, thymic hypoplasia or not. So in this x-ray, uh, you see that it is a narrow pedicle and you get to see the, uh, the thymic shadow is absent. So this could be a condition uh, with thymic hypoplasia, probably you'll have to rule out associated congenital heart disease or microdeletion symptoms. The last uh, part of the A 
uh, stands for the assessment of the lung shadows. So we need to know whether the lung shadows are unilateral or bilateral, whether it is uh, focal or diffuse, homogeneous or non-homogeneous, and also importantly, have a look at the lung volume. So basically, the lung shadows can be classified into either black or white. So the white shadows uh, are otherwise called the opacities. The white shadows uh, you can get to see you get to see white shadows in different pathologies. In the first slide, if you take first X-ray, if you take the white shadow, this is a homogeneous opacity. And if you closely look, uh, the airway is actually pulled to the same side as the same side of the homogeneous opacity. That means here there is a collapse of the lung which is pulling the airway to the same side. And if you have a look at this X-ray picture, the opacity is the same. You get to see an homogeneous opacity, but uh, the media stenum is shifted to the opposite side. The airway is shifted to the opposite side. So probably you might be dealing with a, either a space occupying lesion or it could be an effusion. More commonly, it is an effusion which pushes the media stenum as well as air, airway to the opposite side. <coughs> and here again, you get to see white shadows, but uh, this is a inhomogeneous or heterogeneous white shadow opacification uh, asymmetrical even though it is bilateral it is asymmetrical so probably this is a uh, case of bronchopneumonia now black shadows the most important cause for getting black shadows is air leak symptoms like pneumo mediastinum pneumo thorax or pneumo um, uh, pericardium and uh, there could be uh, focal cystic uh, lesions which can appear black or which can appear hyperlesion like c pan which we'll be discussing later in the towards end of our presentation. So the structured approach, we are done with the A part, which included the airway, the high, the, the media stinum, and the lung shadows. Now coming to the bone, B stands for bone. So have a look at both the clavicles, the long bone, the humerus, the ribs, and also not to forget the vertebral body. So many times it is this finding here in this X-ray we see hemi vertebrae so it is this uh, finding probably which leads to uh, other uh, to, uh, leads to further investigation of this baby uh, you get to uh, sometimes get to see vacuum association etc so it is in, very important that apart from the routine examination of the clavicle radiological radiological x-rays when you see you look at the bones where it is important that you include a uh, survey of the spine as well Now the C stands for the cardiac examination. So with respect to the cardiac size, with respect to the cardiac shape and the type of chamber enlargement, X-rays are important. So the most important thing is to assess whether there is cardiomegaly or not. Now how do you assess cardiomegaly? You are supposed to take the cardiothoracic ratio. So if you are taking the cardiothoracic ratio, uh, draw a line in the cent through the center of the vertebral body, and from this uh, midline, take a Maximum transverse diameter to the right and maximum transverse diameter to the left. Add this maximum uh, diameter on both sides and divide it by the maximum intrathoracic diameter. You will get the cardiothoracic ratio. Now, the normal cardiothoracic, the, in case of cardiomegaly, the cardiothoracic ratio will be more than 60%. The other important thing is look at the uh, position of the apex, and if it is a dextro post heart or if there is any dextrocardia. And Radiologically, what makes up the cardiac borders in X-ray? It is uh, good to have an idea of this. Uh, as you can see, the right heart border is predominantly formed by the right atrium, and some part of it is also formed by superior vein cover. On the other hand, the uh, left heart border is predominantly formed by the left ventricle. So uh, you can make a right atrial enlargement in X-ray as well as left ventricular enlargement in X-ray. Sometimes you get to see pulmonary artery enlargement or prominence of the aortic nephrile as well. So, uh, coming to the D part, that is a diaphragm. Look for the dome of the diaphragm, the intactness of the diaphragm, and the position of the diaphragm. So, normally both the diaphragms are supposed to be at the same level. Some uh, the, the right diaphragm uh, can be at a higher level than the left, but not to the, the, dis, the not to the extent of this nerve. So if you see this X-ray, uh, the right diaphragm is much higher up when compared to the left dome of the diaphragm. And if you count the rib spaces, it is um, one, two, three, three and a half to four spaces above the 
left dome of the left diaphragm. So normally the distance uh, between the right dome and the left dome should never be more than two um, spaces we say. Uh, this is definitely abnormal and this is indicative of eventration of the right dome of the diaphragm. So when you see eventration it could be a birth injury or uh, uh, sometimes you may have an underlying neurological uh, issue with the baby which has led to eventration of the diaphragm. Uh, this picture all of us are familiar with. This uh, shows uh, multiple cystic lucencies in the thorax. We are not able to see the intact diaphragm here. So this is congenital diaphragmatic hernia, left side congenital diaphragmatic hernia. The entire mediastinum is shifted to the uh, right. If you take the case of this x-ray, this is a hyperinflated film as you can see. We are able to uh, count at least nine rib spaces. And the dome of the diaphragm, as you see, is flattened out. It is not the, uh, the normal shape. It is, uh, the dome is actually flattened out, which indicates a hyperinflation. So if the baby is on res is respiratory support and you see this X-ray, it is an indication to come down on the pressures. Uh, so uh, uh, we uh, please do not stop with the examination of the diaphragm. Look a bit down and see for the, uh, see if there is any air under the diaphragm because most often we tend to miss the air under the diaphragm part when you rule out, when you look for pathologies in the lung. So your diaphragm includes, examination of the diaphragm or looking at the diaphragm includes the intactness of the diaphragm, the position of the dome or each dome of the diaphragm as well as any air under the diaphragm. <coughs> now, E stands for the extras. The extras includes the tubes and the lines. <coughs> Sorry for that. <coughs> so uh, the position of the endotracheal tube, the normal position is somewhere between the T1 to T2 or T3 and the lines, if you can see the umbilical arterial line and the umbilical venous line. The umbilical venous line usually lies out to the right of the vertebral body and uh, one point of difference between the umbilical arterial line and the umbilical venous line is that UAC uh, after its insertion, it tends to loop down because it has to enter the external iliac artery and then join the aorta. So there is a looping take place, which takes place uh, in the umbilical arterial line and whereas the umbilical venous line, they go straight. So where do you want your umbilical venous lines to be lodged? The ideal position is just above the level of the diaphragm at the point where the inferior vena cover reaches the uh, right atrium. And the UAC, uh, is supposed to be uh, the high line position of umbilical arterial line is better somewhere between T6 to T10. Uh, so if you count this uh, UAC, this is a 12th rib, the 12th rib and hence this would be the T12, the 12th thoracic spine and you count upwards T12, T11, T10, T9, T8. So this uh, uh, arterial line is lying at the T8 level which is an okay position for a high line uh, umbilical arterial catheter. So one important way of counting uh, for the position of the, counting the ribs, uh, looking for the position of the uh, ET or the UAC is to locate the uh, 12th uh, thoracic vertebrae, 12th vertebrae and the corresponding vertebral body you take it as T12 and then count upwards. Now F stands for the fundic gas shadow. So, the, look for the presence of no, uh, normal fundic gas shadow. If gas shadow is absent, then that could be an indication for iso pure esophageal attrition. As you can see in this x-ray on the right side, where you have looping of the um, uh, feeding tube and you don't see any fundic gas shadow or gasless abdomen here. So, that was a basic structured approach to interpretation of x-ray. Uh, we have dealt with the A, B, C, D, E, F approach. A stands for examination of the airways, the hilum, the lung and the mediastinum. B stands for uh, looking at the bone part of the um, thorax. C, uh, C stand, uh, stood for the cardiac uh, shadow. D for the diaphragm, intactness of the diaphragm. E for the extra lines, extras that includes all the lines and the tubes. And F for the fundic gas shadow. Moving on to few case scenarios. So case one, this is a 27 week uh, 750 gram baby who was born via emergency C-section because of severe preeclampsia in the mother and the mother was not given any steroids. This is a straightforward x-ray which is indicative of severe respiratory distress. So in this slide, we are uh, seeing few x-rays, radiological features of respiratory distress syndrome of a preterm baby. Now, uh, the x-ray picture we can vary. The most common picture is a low volume lung 
with reticulogranular opacities. If it is severe enough, uh, the baby, the cardiac cellout is not uh, is obliterated. You get to see the air bronchogram here. And more severe cases of respiratory distress syndrome, it is a complete opacification, bilateral, symmetrical, homogeneous opacification, which is called the ground glass opacity appearance. Now, what does this air bronchogram mean? Air bronchogram means that you have air filled bronchi which is um, highlighted against the background of the collapsed alveolar. So, under aerated alveolar, you have and the bronchus which is filled with air. So, this stands out in the form of air bronchogram. So, the radiological feature in a respiratory distress syndrome baby would be low volume lung. If, if you see a low volume lung, see, uh, try to open up the lung, the ventilation strategy you would adapt. Adopt is to open up the lung and keep the lungs open by providing adequate P and if required, maybe give surfactant as well. Low volume lung, presence of reticular granular opacities, presence of air bronchogram, obliteration of the cardiac cell out, and finally, in severe cases, uh, it may lead to white out lung. Now, this baby had severe respiratory distress, had to be intubated, was given surfactant. After surfactant, even after giving surfactant, the ventilated parameters remained high. We could not come down on the saturation. So that, that is a point where we took a repeat x-ray and the repeat x-ray showed this. So as you can see, it is a right-sided hyperinflated film and you see a total collapse of the left lung. And if you look at the position of the ET, the tip of the ET is here. And if you count the ribs from above, so this is a T12, this is a 12th rib. Hence, this is a T12 vertebral body, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. So, the ET is lying at between 5th T5 to T6, which is too deep in, and this has got, led on to right-sided administration of surfactant and hence total collapse of the left lung. And that could be the reason why this baby has not improved despite a surfactant administration. And this is another baby who was on CPAP and whose uh, x-ray showed hyperinflation. So this is an indication to come down on the pressures after you give surfactant. Now the same baby, after 12 hours, started having respiratory, worsening respiratory distress, had frothy uh, fluid coming out through the ET. And this was the x-ray picture. This again is a white out lung. Uh, this time it is not due to surfactant deficiency. This is indicative pulmonary hemorrhage. So whenever you see a white out lung, it could be indicative of severe respiratory distress on one point in case of preterm baby. At the same time, always be uh, aware of the uh, complication of pulmonary hemorrhage in, in a baby. So the surfactant, after surfactant administration, the pulmonary pressures come down drastically. There might be increased pulmonary blood flow. And if there is a PD as well in this baby, that both the com combination of these can lead on to hemorrhagic pulmonary edema and uh, a x ray showing pulmonary hemorrhage uh, in this as seen in this x ray. Now, this is another case. This time, this is a term baby who is an AG baby, was an um, uh, infant of diabetic mother, born through an elective uh, C section, had mild respiratory distress, downy 2 to 3, and this is x ray picture. So, what do you see in this x ray picture? You see streaky opacities radiating from the hilum and the perihilar areas, uh, giving rise to what is called the sunburst appearance. And another point is here you see a little fluid in the transverse fissure. So, this is a, a typical of transient tachypnea of newborn. Moving to the case 3, you have a term baby who's, uh, who was born through meconium stained amniotic fluid was a vigorous baby, cried soon after birth, but developed respiratory distress um, after birth and had to be intubated. And this is a classical x-ray you get to see in meconium aspiration syndrome. Here you get to see uh, in meconium aspiration syndrome, the lungs are usually hyperinflated. Uh, you get inhomogeneous opacities, asymmetrical opacities with patchy areas of collapse and areas of um, hyperinflation in, uh, in the same x-ray. So, uh, if you are asked about the x-ray feature in meconium aspiration syndrome when compared to respiratory distress, in our case, the lung volumes are usually uh, on the lower side. In meconium aspiration syndrome, 
the lungs are hyperinflated. Uh, in RDS, usually the opacities are homogeneous and mostly symmetrical, whereas you get to see inhomogeneous fluffy nodular opacities in Meconium maceration syndrome, and they are usually asymmetrical, bilateral, and with areas of hyperinflation. In the same baby, uh, it did not show any sign of improvement even after ventilation. They required high venti parameters, and this was a repeat x ray taken. What do you see here? It is air leak. You see the air leak here with the mar uh, mar collapsed lung margin, but mediastinum is entirely shifted to the opposite side. The airway as well as mediastinum is shifted to the opposite side. So, this is a case of tension pneumothorax. So, intercostal uh, tube drain was put. However, the baby continued to worsen, uh, had a labile saturation, and the repeat x ray showed this picture. Uh, so, here what you see is black lung, totally oligemic lung field because of the persistent pulmonary hypertension, secondary to meconium aspiration in this baby. So, these two x rays are typical of the uh, commonly encountered complication in meconium aspiration syndrome, mainly the air leak, the pneumothorax, as well as a patient which we will get to see. So this is a spectrum of radiological changes you get to see in pneumonia. Uh, it can vary from uh, inhomogeneous bilateral opacities in which you get to see in viral pneumonias to homogeneous opacity involving a specific segment of specific flow. This is a segmental consolidation and here also you again get to see uh, homogeneous opacity involving the upper lobe. So uh, pneumonia could be mostly in a ventilated baby if, if there is radi new radiological changes taking place, probably you are dealing with VAP or ventilator associated pneumonia. This again is a term baby who had no risk factors for sepsis, uh, who had severe respiratory distress were, have to be ventilated. Uh, the worsening respiratory distress and this is an x-ray picture. This is similar to a whiteout lung which we see in RDS and preterm babies and uh, this is based because of the pulmonary venous hypertension in an obstructed KPVC. The heart shadows are normal, there is no cardiomegaly and there is uh, pulmonary venous hypertension and you get this uh, type of whiteout lung in the x-rays. So this is a supracardiac KPVC, another baby, this you don't get to see in the newborn x-rays, the classical figure of age which you will see in older children. The uh, figure of eight, one limb of the figure of eight is from, by the dilated uh, superior vena cava and the other limb is by the abdominal aberrant vessel and you see the left ventricular enlargement and the right atrial enlargement here. So uh, many times uh, there may not be a background for pneumonia early on to sepsis or meconium aspiration syndrome and the baby might be having respiratory distress needing ventilation and you take the x-ray and you uh, get this picture. So in this picture, the what you see is cystic uh, leucencies, focal cystic leucencies involving the left lower lobe where and the mediastinum is shifted to the opposite side, the cardiac apex is shifted to the opposite side. So this could be a CCAM or CPAM or congenital pulmonary airway malformation which you are dealing with which has led to the uh, distress in the baby. And uh, similar, another malformation is a congenital lobar emphysema, more commonly seen on the uh, left upper lobe. You can see this, there is a hyperinflated left upper lobe, which is almost jutting out and crossing the midline. So, uh, in a well-centered picture. So, um, you are supposed to interpret the x-ray only if it is uh, not repeated in a well-centered x-ray and the inspiratory film. So, assuming this is an inspiratory film, and properly positioned x-ray, if you see this kind of uh, focal hyperinflation, congenital lobar emphysema will have to be ruled out. These are various uh, pictures of air leak symptoms which you encounter. The pulmonary interstitial emphysema commonly in a preterm baby, uh, initial uh, days of life where you can see th this is slightly different from the reticular granular opacities which you get in the respiratory distress syndrome x-rays. So, in case of pi, these radial leucencies are streaky and um, uh, uh, transverse streaky radial leucencies because it is air which actually leaks into the interstitium which causes this picture. And uh, this is a pneumopericardium and uh, it appears as if the heart is kept in a bag of air, the heart is lifted up and is uh, surrounded by the hyperleucency. 
Pneumomedia stent is something uh, which is commonly encountered and um, uh, the, uh, you can you see this kind of picture you get the gas shadow in the media stenum. So this is a picture of bronchopulmonary dysplasia in a growing preterm baby who is oxygen dependent. Uh, you have uh, old BPD and new BPD. Uh, you have to adjust your ventilation parameters based on the X-ray findings. So here you get to see uh, areas of uh, hyperlucency, cystic lucencies uh, with areas of atelectasis. So you will have to adopt a strategy which can suit uh, both of these areas of hyperinflation with prolapse and which uh, subsequently will be dealt in the uh, ventilation offline classes. Thank you for the patient hearing.